Three, two, beep. Do you have any other Aston noise, man? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to today's Crush Talk Podcast. Hey, welcome to Crush Talk. We have our very, very first guest. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. It's my own sister, Elizabeth. Atawaya Wolfram, or is it Wolfram Atawaya? Okay. Welcome, Liz. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you, Jean and Shell. I feel honored to be your first guest. <laughs> well, it's going to be history. It really is. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, because not everybody knows why you live in Virginia and why are you in the state of Washington. Can you back up and tell us what your life is right now? Uh, well, my life right now, um, my husband is a... Uh, a D1 coach. And so I pretty much have been following him with our family. We're in Provo for a couple of years. And then we were in Virginia for the past six years. And then with the coaching lifestyle and getting jobs, we ended up here in, uh, in Pullman, Washington. So my life is basically in the nutshell. That's how it's been. So. Oh, and so n nobody knows how long have you been there in Washington? About three months now. Oh so God. we're just new. Yeah, we're new with this coaching staff and it's been great. It reminds me of Minnesota, very humble people, just down to earth. So it's good to be here. Okay. So really quick, before we jump into the meat and potatoes of everything, <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, we're a few years older, right? So there's a lot of people that may not know exactly who you are. So let's just kind of bring that to light so that everybody's kind of on the same page. But um Liz is Eugene's sister, and she was actually the main singer of the Jets. She was the voice of the Jets. She was the magic. The 80s uh, group that they were in. And um, I'm sure you've heard a lot of her voice all over the place. Uh, she Some of her biggest hits were Make It Real, um, you got my it personal all. favorite, You Got It All, <laughs> and just a bunch of other wonderful songs. So if you're... Um, not sure who the Jets are, just go and um, Google those songs and you'll see. And that is um, who we're speaking with today. You, just like your brother and your other siblings, you guys were big uh, stars. You know, you guys toured all over the world and and even when at such a young age, but you guys were always so mature. You were in the limelight spotlight. You guys couldn't go to the store, you know, all that fun <laughs> stuff. And now, fast forward, yeah. you, like your brother um stepped away from it all so tell us a little bit about what made you step away from all the the limelight the fame and so forth what was it that made you step away from that that's a good question um well i think uh i think growing up for me personally mm -hmm. you know I, I had a great childhood with the family just because we traveled and that's all that i knew but I knew that when I got married and, and wanted to start a family, I didn't want to be living out of a suitcase anymore. I knew I wanted to be settled and grounded and not and not kind of be everywhere. And maybe, you know, G knows me really well. I'm like a bookworm. And even though I was a lead singer, that wasn't something that I um, that that I wanted. It's one of those things when mom and dad heard me sing, you know, I had to be in the front, um, whether I wanted to, wanted to or not. I can look back now and say I'm grateful, but I think... Um, what made me step away is that I knew when I when I started a family, I I wanted to be home. I wanted to be the mom and I didn't want any nannies or anyone else raising my kids. And and I just, I don't know, I, you know, I was always a uh, a nerd, but I, I wanted to find someone that would love me for me and, and create a home where um, I, that it'd be, I'd be happy. And so I think that's mainly why I stepped away. That is amazing. And I, I also got to just say, I, I'm going to insert all this because um, Liz is one of the most humblest people I have <laughs> ever met in the whole wide world. True. Opposite of me. <laughs> opposite, opposite of this guy. Okay. I'm going to go broke sending you opposite. guys money with all these compliments. Well, <laughs> you but, have Venmo? We'll yeah. Venmo you. <laughs> but, but the thing about it is you're, you're, you're very, you are so not, the persona that you have when you were performing is so not 
who you are really off the stage. Like, right. you know, uh, what's Sasha Fierce? Is that who, who is that? Oh, yeah. Uh, Beyonce. Beyonce. Yeah. Beyonce <laughs> you know, like, or, you know, you, you were just so magical on the stage, but when you come off, I love it. You're, you're Liz is the most, uh, like I said, humblest. She yeah. is so shy. She's not glitzy. <laughs> She is just, she is just the humblest thing. And I, I remember, and I, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but um, at our wedding, when Gina and I got married, your mom made these beautiful dresses, just beautiful dresses. I mean, back in the day, the taffeta, and it was so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Liz went to the beach and she got a little burned. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> and she put, she, your, her mom made her this beautiful pink dress and she did not want to wear it because she said it matched her sunburn and she cried because she didn't want to wear it, but she was so beautiful. I was like, Oh my gosh, you're so beautiful. She's like, Nope, I don't want to do it. But that's just the kind of person you are. And so to see you now transition to like, I, in our culture, we call it, you know, the Molly homemaker, Molly Mormon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is Liz. Liz is, she's a, a volleyball mom. She's a football, football mom. mom. <laughs> she's a sports mom. She drags her kids all over the place following her husband and that that is just that is awesome we love that you know what is, is kind of cool too liz is that um most people that are in the business that are usually the lead singer oh they can't get enough of that limelight like they want more and oh yeah i'm the lead singer oh but they really they, they can never get away from it you know what i mean like they yeah they that's what they crave right. and as and you can ask, and I can say this, you can ask any one of our siblings, um, you definitely were the magic of our group, the voice, the look, and everything. But it, it's amazing, and that's one of the reasons why, well, one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to you is that not a lot of people know that. It's like, you, you can live without it, but amazingly, you had that wonderful talent. So I just want to throw that out there. Oh, thanks, Gene. You know, I think being in the, in the, in the in industry, we learned, you know, you learn a lot and it can be addicting like what you said that, you know, the feedback you get from the crowd. And I think for me, there came a point where, you know, I had opportunities to do solo projects and actually did one with another producer who I loved and I, and I believed in that project, but I knew that there's always going to be a give and take, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing a, a career and I want a family, I mean, with the music, I mean, you can do both. I mean, people say you can do both, but for me, it was really an either or, and I knew that one would suffer. So if I want to be a stay at home mom and, and raise my kids and have a marriage, my music will suffer. But if I concentrate on, you know, doing a solo project and trying to do music, um, I wouldn't be home. You know, I wouldn't, I would have to get a nanny. I wouldn't be there all the time. Um, like I know that I wanted. And so for me, that was a really clear thing I had to, it was very clear to me that you had to choose one or the other to, to really dedicate myself to. I know that people have done both, but for me personally, it was an either or for me. And obviously I wanted that family. Okay. So like, so you've been away from it for a while. So what do you miss? Do you miss anything of the, that life before? Like, what is it that you miss? You know, what I miss the most is traveling, room service, and then just being with my siblings. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of drama, you know, we had, I mean, I should say there's a lot of drama, you know, Gene, but we, yeah. the fun part for me doing this whole thing was never about being a star. I just love being with my family. I love being with my parents. I love being with my siblings, even, even though Gene was slapping the forehead and say, good morning, sunshine. <laughs> um, I really, when people ask me about that, my favorite thing is that I was with my family. If I was with my brothers and sisters on the stage and it was all that hard work that went behind it and all the sacrifices, as long as I knew that I was with them, I, I you know, I, I, I'd probably still be doing it if that was still the, um, how it started with, you know, how it originally started in, in its purest form, it, I would probably still be doing it. Um, one thing I know that I do miss besides, you know, the room service <laughs> is, um, it came to a point that I really did enjoy being on the stage and I loved it. And I kind of felt like I could, uh, relate to artists saying that when they're on the stage, they became a different person. Like, you know, Shell, you mentioned, because she knows I'm very shy. I don't really care to be in front. I'd like to blend in with the mall wall and, and didn't want that. But I, I grew to appreciate the talent that I was given. And when I was on stage, I did for a moment feel I could do anything on that stage. You know, I could sing anything and I could, you know, 
it became something that I really enjoyed. So when I had to make that choice of stepping back, um, you know, I knew that that would be something I would miss. So when I do get on the stage, you know, rarely nowadays, it's a lot more funner because when I get back on there, I take off my glasses, I'm half blind, but I'm back in that same space of like, man, this is a great place. I can do anything and just have fun and, and be in the moment. And so um, what do you, how do you feel now, you know, being the homemaker, being, you know, following your husband all around and so forth? Like, right. What, what, What's that like now for you? Um, it's great. You know, I think the beautiful thing about marriage, at least for me, is that it's not one or the other. Um, I think one thing I learned is that um, you don't really have to choose one or the other. You just choose what's right for you and you make it happen. And so I think with my husband, I know I've had comments of or people say, well, why did you, you know, don't you miss singing? Why did you leave your career? You, you know, did you give it up for your husband? And I don't feel like I have. Um, I, I feel like whether it's music with my family or being married, you know, to my husband, for me, the singing is always going to be there because I got, it's right here. <laughs> you know, it, it didn't leave me anywhere. Um, and so I, I don't feel like I've given anything up for the life that I chose. If anything, it's made music more beautiful to me. And when I am able to do it, it's at a more, it's at a more real place because of the experiences with being married and, having children and being broke as a joke. And then, you know, <laughs> life just happens and going through, you know, law school with six kids. And then, I mean, life gives you these beautiful experiences that make the music and the singing and the performing, I think, um, at least for me, hopefully more genuine and more authentic. So when it does happen and I'm able to do it, which I hope now that the kids are getting older, I'm able to do a little bit more of it. Um, that It comes from, I think now from more of a place of, of, of just gratitude for the, the talent. I think I heard something really there. Someone I, I heard, I think it was Elder Bednar, if you remember the church. He, I was into a podcast and he mentioned something about there really is, I mean, he kind of mentioned, I don't know if I'm getting this wrong, about balance. He said there really yeah. is no thing about really balancing. I think it's, if I'm at home, I'm 100% at home. Yeah. If I'm at church, I'm 100% at church. If I'm making chili for a school project. I'm 100% into my chili and cutting the hot dogs and what, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's yeah. just being present in those moments that kind of, um, yeah, just being, yeah. So, so let me that. ask you something. It's not in our questions real quick. Um, everyone, everyone knows about our family, right? Uh, 17, right. we go to church, we try to be good, good Christians and whatnot. But it, it seems like, um, to me that, uh, that's a big part of your life even more now as a mother and as a wife. How has your beliefs um, helped you in, in, through all this stuff that you've been through? And continue? Man, you know, I think I was very, um, I don't say bl uh, lucky. I think ever since I was a little girl, when we used to hear my grandpa, you know, Grandpa Yohani speak. Right. Um, it was something I think from a very young age, I recognized and, and knew that knew that whatever he was speaking, whether about the gospel or, or, or the church, there was truth there. And so as a little girl, that always, that was nothing I ever questioned because it rang true to my spirit. You know what I mean? Um, so I think, you know, going through the stuff with our family, going through the career and, you know, the fame and all of that, it just, it's always been an anchor to kind of, at least for me, has always kept me, um, it's, it's been a, a an anchor of just kind of, okay, Liz, who are you? I mean, you know, I was a teenager when we went through that. So, you know, lucky it's not today because it would be really hard with the social media and, you know, a lot of the stuff that you get on that with the way you look and the way you dress and how you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where when I had those little experiences back in the 80s, I mean, I had the young women's thing. You know, I knew who I was. I was a daughter of God who loved me and I loved him. So it didn't matter that my nose was big or we got a record, uh, a letter from the record company that we got from the manager saying, hey, the girls look like they've gained weight. I mean, in the Crush on You video, I was supposed to wear green pants, but they put on black pants because my hips were too big. Um, I was 14 at the time. You know, th those are things that I remember getting and hearing these little comments with, you know, private number video. They had to tie something around my waist because trying to make me look smaller because my you know, I was just getting big, but the gospel has always reminded me of who I am. And so through that, why, you know, young single adult dating, you know, that was another thing to navigate. The gospel has always been a constant anchor of kind of bringing me back to uh, what's most important 
And they, I've just always gone back to um, who I am. I'm a daughter of God. And that's always been a guiding light for me to kind of, you know, if I'm not in a good place and getting married and just whatnot, it, as long as I've always remembered who I am, right. I've always been able to kind of like reset my course and be like, okay, this is where I not to, this is where I need to be. Oh, that's, that's awesome. awesome. And I think that's the good thing also about our culture. You know, you already know Polynesians cultures. You always have that one auntie or right. that one mother that's like. <laughs> Oh, girl, uh, you better lose some weight. You better go, you know. And so I feel like all our lives are like, oh, yeah, we know, auntie. Yeah, okay. But, you know, in our culture, big is beautiful. Big is well, the better, you know. Them, That's why Thank you, Lord. Well, you know what? When I did the little promo thing for the podcast, and I asked everybody, hey, give me questions. We're going to start a podcast. A lot of them were, hey, dude, you look kind of big. And are you sick? And whatnot, and then when I saw myself on the camera, like now, I'm like, Holy I am sick. <laughs> I said, Is that what you thought? Sorry, I said, Holy shiz, because like you know me, Liz, I'm not appropriate all the time. But, okay, okay, so Liz, it's October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Yes, yes. You guys, like that? Cancer awareness. Everybody, you can use easy, it. Easy, easy. You have some experience in this, so if you don't mind sharing yeah. that experience with us. Okay, well, I kind of don't know where to begin. So maybe I'll just, I mean, um, so yeah, I was 22 years old when I discovered that I had breast cancer. Um, and I think that was the time when our family was working on the, the Love People album. You know, we're independent. We were already not with the record company. But I was also, that was at the time where I met Mark again, because we met his teenagers. And, um, wait, 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 Jake, real oh. quick, real quick. You met, who did you... Um, <clears throat> Who did you meet him? I mean, with who? Like, <laughs> helped hey, him? let him introduce the dude's name. I'm just name. saying. I'm just saying. You know. She has been cool. saying this is my husband's name. <laughs> yeah, okay. anyway. You're right, Shell. I, I owe big thanks to Gene and Shell because oh, if it wasn't you. for your guys, you know, you getting married, and then because you guys got married, Dad let me and Wana stay in Laia a little bit longer, which he never did. That I finally got to meet Gene. I mean, Mark. Um, because oh, the name. bikes and yeah. yeah, that's where I got to meet Mark. And I think I was 17 or, oh, and I was 18 and he was 17. Oh, barely. Legal. Yeah. So we went to a game. He was there playing against Farrington and I was blown away by the Kahuku cheerleaders. And I kept hearing a name. Mark, that's why I touched down, but I wasn't even paying attention. I was like, this band is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we left La Ia, and then they're like, oh, he's this. And I was like, oh, I, yeah. Oh, I guess he's really good. <laughs> Kind of, huh? Yeah, yeah. Which is, I think, uh, what that was 91 when I met him? Mm -hmm. Or 1990, and then we met again in 94 when he got off his mission. And um, it was then that I, I think I was an oddball because I was the one that read magazines and I learned about self-breast examination. And oh. so when I'd read that, so every time I showered, I would, you know, make, did I feel anything weird? And it was uh, when I was 22 that I felt something that was that wasn't right. And I was familiar with my body enough to know that that doesn't feel right. Um, so at 22, they checked me out and we had a little, you know, about the size of a, a little golf ball. You know, they did the biopsy and everything. And I think then they said everything was okay. But when it came back and grew to the size of like a small lemon, uh, uh, melon, uh, when they did that, they pretty much said it was cancer. And they gave me five months to live and... They, um, I don't think they, they knew quite for sure if it spread everywhere because, you know, it's your lymph nodes, but they removed it. I had a mastectomy on my right breast and, uh, and then, um, and then I just experienced a beautiful thing with what my faith is and, and, you know, kind of pointed me in a direction that I knew I really had to, um, be true to myself and what, um, choices that I had to make when I, you know, I left the family and doing the music and starting my own family. When I, they gave me five months to live, uh, my dad um, called my grandpa, your honey, and I was given a priesthood blessing. And in that priesthood blessing, my grandfather basically said, it's by your faith that you will live and that you, you know, don't, the doctors have done all that they can, but there's really no more that they can do. Because after taking that, then it would go through you know, a lot of what the, you know, I think it was the radiation at the time. This was this was 27 years ago, so it's the 
how they do it nowadays is a lot different. You know, is I think it was a lot more radical back then. You know, it's just mm. really brutal. Um, and so when I went back to the doctor after you know the mastectomy, I pretty much didn't go back anymore because of that blessing. And wow. I knew that the doctors could have. Uh, they did all that they could, and I'm so grateful for them. But at the same time, um, when you're told that you only have five months to live and I'm barely engaged and I want to have a family and I want to be married, I mean, you're, it brings everything to a, to a, you know, for me, it was a pivotal moment. You know, I, I, do I believe this or do I not? And it was back to my childlike faith that my grandpa gave me a blessing. Um, I've always felt truth with him. And I know what I believe. I know that the Savior lives. I know my Heavenly Father knows me. And that blessing was a either or for me. And I just never went back to the doctor after that. And I'm 27 years later, I'm, I'm still here and seven kids. And um, it's been a real test of faith. I think the beautiful thing about that experience, Gene, wasn't that I was healed from cancer, but that my faith was increased. Awesome. That was the big miracle because... It was, wasn't any more anything about the physicality because whether I was here or not, my one thing with the Lord that I did get angry was that I want a family and I want to be here to raise my kids. You can't take that away from me. And I came to a point where I realized that if I trust him, whether I'm here or not, and I know that he is real to me, then whatever is the best thing for my life, I got to put in his hands. And that that was a miracle for me. It was that my faith was made more sure. So, okay. So real fast, let's, let, let's talk about, so you mentioned you got seven kids. I love it. Um, you're only 10 off the mark. You just need 10 more. And then you're a real <laughs> catch up with mom. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we got one brother. That's so close. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Almost there. Yeah. Honey. <laughs> yeah. They can have all the kids for us. Anyway. So tell us oh. how many kids and their ages. And what are they up to? Okay, well, I have seven kids. My oldest is Anessa. She um, graduated from BYU during COVID. Um, but she's a professional working right now with the environmental construction company. Ooh. And then I have Alema, who's 23. <laughs> and she also graduated from BYU in 21. And she was working at a, at a real estate law firm. But now um, her and my two oldest are preparing for the LSAT. And so crossing fingers, I guess they decided to follow in their father's footsteps, but they're just taking it one day at a time. I have my son, uh, Ty Atuaya, who's serving the Utah Ogden mission right now. Then my second son, Tiana Kuma, who just got called to the Bentonville, Arkansas mission. Nice. Uh, and he um, reports in November. Yeah, Walmart. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, Walmart. <laughs> and then uh, there's um, Abby, who's 16, a junior in high school. Ropati is a seventh grader. And then my youngest, Hepri. Or Perry. She's my fourth. Hey, Perry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I love it. Perry. I'm, I'm Perry's mom. That's Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Your hubby, like what's what's he up to? How's he doing? Is he uh, enjoying the the life there in Pullman? He is. You know, he's a hard worker. I mean, you know, I mean he you know, we had three kids and the thing I love about the Polynesian culture is that, you know, he was kind of trying to figure out what's going to happen because, you know, he's a football player and the dream was to go play in the NFL. You know, that's the mm -hmm. dream. Then you can take care of your family. And when that didn't happen, that was a real, um, that was really hard for him. That was really hard for him to swallow. Um, but as Polynesians and growing up, I think in our generation, you know, the dad called, what are you doing, son? Okay. You need to get your butt back in school. You're coming home. You're going through peace, you know, people in Hawaii. And I'm very grateful that I think for our generation, it was just like, you know, whether you're 30 or whatever, your parents say something, you go and do. Um, but that's led him to, you know, finishing school and then eventually getting a, a law degree and his master's in public administration. And it's funny how all that went back to coaching, <laughs> which I, I know my mother-in-law was like, what? You just went through all of this and now you're going to be a coach. <laughs> um, but it's a blessing, you know, there's, it's, that education was there for a reason and we don't know what's ahead, mm -hmm. but um, he's been the D1 coach. You know, he coached at BYU for a couple of years, I think for four or five years. And then we went to Virginia um, for six seasons and now we're here in Pullman. So he loves it and it's his passion. And uh, if one thing I've learned about being married, you know, they say happy wife, happy life, but it really is uh, uh, the same thing with your husband. I, he had a great job before he went back to school and I'm just sharing this, uh, you know, he made, good money 
But I noticed when he came home, he just wasn't happy. It was like the, the light wasn't there. And um, when he mentioned about, you know, law school and all of that, I was on board. But when it came to football, um, there's light there and there's happiness there. And I, so I think that's something I hope with my kids have got that when you love something and the passion is there, don't worry about the money. Everything else will follow, whatever, you know, whatever that is. So I'm he loves it. It's his passion and it's become my passion and it's become our kids' passion. And hopefully that's teaching them to have, you know, passion in their life and living that to the fullest. So Okay, so we, we interviewed your brother uh, a few <laughs> nights ago. So now I'm gonna ask you a few of the same questions. That was terrible. Who, <laughs> it was great, Gene. <laughs> in my own mind. Who is like who were you like starstruck when you first met them? What what star? Okay. Okay, I'll have to be uh, the first one was Madonna. Oh, so we met her at the American Music Awards backstage. And it's really funny because I got to meet her and Whitney Houston that same night backstage because me and Rory were going to present an award for Best Country. And of course, Alabama, I think they won like every year in the 80s. They kept winning the Best Country uh, duo or group. Um, and it was striking the difference because I got to meet Madonna. I was so excited to meet her. And um, yeah, Don Prowler, manager, brought her over and said, oh, this is, you know, uh, she would really love to meet you. And I just remember the difference between meeting her and then meeting Whitney was day and night. Mm-hmm. Whitney was so warm. She actually sang to me, you got it all. The chorus, she goes, I know your song. And she's saying, you know, <laughs> you got it all. And I just, um, I think that was a moment that I remember because I could see, um, I just hope, man, if I ever became like them or was like that, that hopefully I would be like Whitney, warm and just, she was very sweet and just, and she knew who we were. She knew our song, Gene, which was amazing. So I was like, whoa. So that was pretty cool. That's that's ironic. So she asked me who I was all that's struck question, by. Yeah. And I said, Whitney Houston. Because <laughs> remember, we were in New York. We're doing a, a show and we all got in the elevator. I, and you know me, I'm not, I <laughs> talk all the time and I, my mouth was wide open. Going, oh. And it's ironic that she brought up Whitney. Yeah. yeah. She, she was special. Yeah, we Beautiful had a soul. Happy I got to hear it seen live at least once at the Grammy Awards because her voice was God given. So, who is your favorite all time singer? Oh gosh, you know my kids ask me that all the time. I think I have to go back to when I was a kid because it was. I mean, I copied her. I just loved her. It was uh, it was Michael Jackson as a kid and Olivia Newton John. Oh, you know, hopelessly devoted in Rose Park, listening to that soundtrack over and over again and. I'm grateful they caught a snippet, a snippet of of me singing that, you know, in Minnesota. It's my first but yeah, I knew all her songs. And then after that was Pat Benatar, was all those, you know, ladies from the 70s and 80s. And uh, We're going to put on that clip. like when we, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Put on you, uh, one, our Quasar days. <laughs> yeah. And our... But the shorts were the best. So. Oh, hey, man, Gene, you were rocking it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Come on, gonna... Shell. You gotta be be honest. That caught your eye. <laughs> Not in the way you think. <laughs> what do you listen to now? That's so f- it's okay. You know what? I listen to whatever my kids are listening to, and oh. I don't know who the artists are, but I'm always telling them. You know, they sampled that from. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's originally from. No, yeah, they, yeah. So they get they get shocked, but I discovered Olivia Rodrigo because of them, Billie Eilish, and. Awesome. You know, a bunch of yeah. So I'm so I'm old. You know, I just go back to my playlist, and they're like, uh, again. I forgot you're so much older than me because I'm. Only <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, you look good. Anyways, okay. Whatever. In the family, we all know the the funny stories from back in the day. You know, whether they be the Fabi ones or oh, right. tell me what your favorite memory is, whether it be Quasar days or Jet days. Like your favorite funniest uh, story? I'm trying to think about that. There is a lot. There's a lot of them, but none of them are coming to my brain right now. Okay. Uh, do you remember any, Gene? I'm trying to. Yeah. Uh, it was. I, we had a blue blue bus. Okay. All, all I know is you love that blue bus and the and the, the big mattress in the back, and you guys oh, would yeah. they would pop you guys up and down. But, right. It's safety uh, um, today. Oh, I I think one was. We warmed up at the Super Bud Fest, and we started our concert, and we were saying, hey, bye-bye, and it was the last. They opened the doors, and we were doing our last song, so we got yes. 
that was kind of not nice. But yeah, we were performing for yeah, you're right. I remember that. Yep, I remember falling on the stage. I think we were playing with Lisa Lisa in California. Yep. I remember losing my balance and I forgot the words and uh, I, I was trying to make it look cool. Obviously, I didn't because I knew Lisa Lisa and the Cult Jam were there. So yeah. <laughs> one day we'll talk about um, one of his favorite stories. As you guys are in the bus, I think you're in Canada, and you know, times were kind of skimpy before you guys became the Jets. And um, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say this. Well, it's okay. Dad is dad is in heaven. <laughs> Love you, Dad. Um, on the bus, and all of a sudden, he pulls, he stops the bus, and he gets oh. out, and he takes off his outer clothes, and he grabs the gun, was it, or the machete, and starts walking with, with into Uncle the, oh, yes. walking <laughs> to the lake, the to swamp. go, oh, swamp. swamp, to go kill the big moose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that they, you guys would have food. Well, we, it, it was a, it wasn't a, just a tour of music; it was a tour of whatever roadkill. You remember? Yes, yes. Dad was good with roadkill. I don't know how we survived on that, but we did. That, yeah, I live. We'll and, save that for later. Yeah. No, <laughs> Another story. It's why we don't die because we eat everything that's on the road. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. immune because we, yeah, we eat all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> if there is one thing that you could, um, one thing that you could change, for example, if there's one thing you could change um, about, the past, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think maybe that's a good question, Shaw. Oh, man, it's like deep thoughts there. I told her to tell you that. <laughs> Do you see that we're equally equal? No. Right. So, me and Oprah, we like this. Okay, <laughs> well, you know, when you get older, you're like, I don't regret anything because I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for that. But, um, if I could change anything maybe about the past is maybe being more, more present, you know, in the moment. Uh, because I think when I, I was so young that so many things happened, I just, you know, I was just following orders, following the itinerary, following where we needed to be that I look back now, now and think if that was today, I would have taken more time to be in the city and, and really experience it more instead of just, you know, just following an itinerary of what, what we had to do that day. Okay. Favorite jet song. Oh gosh. Okay. Favorite jet song uh is probably I I'd like singing Make It Real. And then the fast order would probably be um the one we did uh with Fasal Benford. Um what Special Kind of Love? Special Kind of Love. Yeah. I love singing mm -hmm. that live. That that we'll have to talk about the making <laughs> of that video that. Yeah, that video, yep, Gene was in that video. Yeah, there was a lot of tears and hard work, <laughs> right? I felt like I actually looked cool dancing on that video. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, you did. Okay, you okay, actually, right? You did. You were, you just did. back in that day, you know, yes. the whole atmosphere, and then the Polynesian flair, the poi balls. Right, right. The lights. Remember I that? was trying to represent with those poi balls, and I'm telling uh, you now. Uh, we played all those video. years on the road doing the, the right, right. take off for that one 10 seconds. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, my kids saw that video and, and I said, hey, I can still do those moves. <laughs> okay. They, they watched the video. I did the moves and I sprained something and I couldn't finish it. ran out of breath. <laughs> but I told them I still know it. So, What is it for Crush Talk for you guys? What made this something that you guys wanted to do? Having a, a, a good platform that we can help others because we just talked about breast awareness and it's a conversation that needs to be said. Like, we need to talk about things that are important. Music for, like, I don't know if you agree with me, but music is so powerful for everyone. When a song comes on, the memory of where you were, where you were, where you lived, and things were happening. And that's why your voice and on our music, there's not a person I don't run into that if your ballad or your song that you sung have come up, there is a long memory. I love that there's a platform here, especially for our, po our po Polynesian people. You know, you're right. Music is powerful because it takes you to a place you're able to express. I mean, it goes back to our history. You know, we don't, it's not on papers. It's in song. It's in language. It's in, you know, that form. And so, I mean, as Polynesian, it's great that you can have a platform to be open and speak about things. I mean, not only, you know, breast cancer, but there's mental illness. There's all those issues that, you know, we don't talk about as a culture of Polynesians, but we just keep it in and we don't, you know, everything's okay. Everything's okay. But then, you know, there's suicide, there's mental illness, there's all these other things that depression, you know, generation, you know, 
they need to speak about it and have a voice so that we can understand and do better. So I love our OGs. I mean, you know, at TV said they kept it real. Like, you know, Shell said, hey, you put on a few pounds. I mean, they're just on brutally honest, but in a very loving way. And it's great now to take what, the best that we got from them. And then with this, with this new generation, um, really ha- help them um, not only find their voice, but be able to express it. Because that was something I think for me, you know, that was something being obedient was more important than what I had to say. You know, what the elders wanted me to do was more important than than maybe some things that I felt, you know, I needed to to do. But there's a right way to do it. And I, I'm very right. grateful that you have this platform so that we can speak and talk about it because the more we talk about it, I think yeah. it, it's great. Tell us just like briefly, typical life in the day of Liz Wolfgram Atuaya right now. <laughs> uh, basically like every other mom, wake up, get your kids out the door, eat breakfast, make sure they don't forget their helmet, their brains, their just everything, <laughs> them to school. And then, you know, after that's the cleanup around the, you know, clean up around the house and whatever little time you have is, you know, shopping or just doing what you need to do. And then they come home and it's the madness again of homework and laundry and dinner and family prayer and just making sure everyone's in a good place and prayer and go to sleep and start again. So that's basically <laughs> my life, which I love. I, I think the older my kids get, I realize my house is getting more quiet and that makes me sad. <laughs> so I'm ready for grandbabies hopefully soon. I don't think my girls are here, but soon. Do we have any other questions? Because we can go on for days. But... Just one last question, okay, to top it off. So if there's one thing, one piece of advice you could leave to the world, what would it be? Well, I would say for me, if I was going to give it to the world, is to, oh gosh, that's a hard one is to know who you are because for me knowing who I am that I'm a daughter of God and my relationship with my savior has always been the one thing that has kept me um, grounded and especially in the world that we live in today it's so hard just to be lost and forget who you are and I think that's one thing I found when I did have to make tough choices I always had to go back to um, the little girl that I felt was that was never there because I had to grow up so quick yeah. And that reminded me of what's pure, what's, what is the, what, what's the right thing, at least for me. So I, if there's any advice I would give is to just know who you are. Cause once you know who you are, everything else starts to make sense. And for me, that is knowing that I'm a daughter of God. Thank you. Thank you so very much for coming on tonight and sharing and letting, you know, everybody all 10 of us watching that's going to watch the podcast um, see your inner beauty not only your superstardom from the past but yeah. your inner beauty and the real superstar that you are today so thank you we thank love you. you if you can love just you Tina Shell. Love, love you more you. send us off with the are you still going to ask her to see <laughs> Yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll go. Um, How are we going to end our, our podcast? Heck yeah. We'll see. Uh, at least I know Perry will like it. So Perry will be like, yes, yeah, there's hey, mom. Perry. <laughs> yeah, Perry. Well, well, aren't you Perry's mom? Yeah, you're here. Yep, yep. uh, yes, I That's am. Ladies and gentlemen, Perry's mom. Yes, I love it. My favorite title. I'll take that title any day. Absolutely. So, okay, well, say, I guess we'll go. I'll just, I loved you. You didn't feel the same. And though we're apart, you're in my heart. Give me one more chance to make it real. Oh, you just, just made our podcast real. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, love you guys. Thank you we so much. You. Love you so much. Kiss all the kids and you're happy for me, okay? I will. Love, I love you. you guys.